Dr. Leonard Sachs came out. He uh, has written uh, Why Gender Matters and all sorts of books on gender. And like you, believes there are two genders and they're not easily exchanged, uh, forgotten, dismissed, and so on. And he's written a lot on it. And we took calls from the audience members at the end of his interview. And one of our listeners named Amy called in with a heartbreaking question. And Dr. Sachs, who's great, and we love him, gave an honest answer for him. He wasn't able to help her. It was beyond his area of expertise. It was a sad moment, but we knew we could find somebody who could answer it, and hence you're on. But here is that exchange for listeners who missed it. My child's 23. Um, I had a lot of stuff going on 10 years ago. Tried to be the best mom, but uh, now I'm, I'm the mom of one of those kids that's having a lot of these issues. Too much Instagram at the time for her, um, overweight, depressed. Three years ago, she came to me and said she's gay. Her girlfriend now um, went through a bunch of anorexia stuff um, in high school, is now even thinking of um, affirming to being a male. And I'm, I, I support my child. I love my child. I will do anything for her. And I just want to know, is there anything I can do now? Ten years Thank after you. the fact. That is my most feared question. Um, mm. I have a lot of strategies that I can share with confidence if the child is 10, 12, 14, 16 years of age. And I share them with confidence because I've seen them work. At age 23, for a young woman... I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss. I'm not the best person for you to ask. I have very little to mm -hmm. offer that I'm confident will be effective. Mm. And by the way, uh, Dr. Sachs in that interview does lay out some of those strategies for the younger ages. If you start, start to see somebody getting pulled into this, as does Deborah So in her book, Abigail Schreier, Schreier does as well. But what, what about this situation, Deborah? Like, the 23-year-old, they're almost fully cooked. They've flown the coop. They're no longer in your house every day. And now, in this woman's case, the daughter's trying to say that she thinks she's a boy, she's a man, and the mother isn't exactly buying it. Yeah, it's such a heartbreaking call. And it's so typical, I would say, in terms of what I have been hearing from families who are going through this, in terms of things that the child is presenting with. So I want to start by saying that I don't do clinical work anymore. I'm basing my opinions on the scientific research, on conversations I've had with my colleagues who do work with these patients who have gender dysphoria. Also conversations I've had with families who are going through this and discussions I've had with the transitioners. So people who have socially and in many cases medically transitioned um, and then realized that that decision was not actually right for them. And they've since detransitioned and returned to living as the sex they were born as. So, I mean, once once the child is adult age, like you said, the parents are really, um, their hands are tied. There's not really anything they can do. And I would say even for children nowadays, what, what will happen is the state or agencies will come in and will actually help to facilitate a transition, even if the parents are not on board with that. And you have things like sanctuary states becoming more uh, prominent in which a child can actually be taken by an adult to that sanctuary state, such as California. And if they decide to transition, even if, if transition is not supported in the home state, the authorities cannot go after them and California will not prosecute either. So in terms of my advice, I, I obviously haven't met this caller, Amy, um, so I can't unfortunately speak to her, the specifics of her case. But what I would say is, so for your audience, I'm sure they know, they've, they've probably heard us talk about this last time I was on your show, but rapid onset gender dysphoria, this is a phenomenon in which young people, predominantly girls and young women, are coming out as transgender, often very much out of the blue, no previous history of gender dysphoria. In some cases, they're quite comfortable in their bodies as girls, young women. They, in some cases, go through puberty and actually like that they have a more feminine body. But there are other factors that come into play, you know, sexism, history of sexual trauma, uh, if they are on the autism spectrum, if they are lesbian and not quite comfortable with their sexual orientation, eating disorders, other mental health issues, personality disorders, 
anxiety, depression. So all of these things, um, or even I would say just not really feeling like they are a typical girly girl or being gender nonconforming, they think that life would be better for them as male or as a third gender. And as you said, I am firmly of the belief, based on the scientific research, there are two genders. There's no such thing as being a third gender or non-binary. So what I would say is uh, I think therapy can be very helpful. I would say if if a parent is in this situation to, uh, and this is very common also, the, the re relationship between a parent and the child tends to be strained. And so that's why the child initially will go onto social media, go onto the internet, trying to make sense of the way that they're feeling. And they don't necessarily have a, the, that support where they can go to a trusted adult. So what happens instead is they come across gender ideology on the internet that tells them basically for anyone who is uncomfortable with in their body, which is very common, especially for young women, or maybe they don't like being sexualized by society. They see these images on social media and they think that's what I'm supposed to look like. That's how I'm supposed to behave. I'm supposed to be very sexual and enjoy that sexualization. And if they don't, they think, well, I must not be female. And so I would say for, say, a child who has a stronger relationship with their parents, they can go to the parents and talk to them about what they're feeling. And especially, I would say, for young women going through puberty is, I mean, I have not so great memories of the process myself. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's not only is your body changing, you know, the way society looks at you is changing. And these are all very normal feelings to have. I would also say menstruation. Menstruation is, again, not the greatest, funnest thing to be going through. But that's just a part of womanhood. And I would say it's something that we as women should actually be proud of, that we have the capability to you know, carry children. And so all of that is to say, I think therapy with the parent and the child together will be helpful. I'll go into uh, my suggestions in terms of how to find a good therapist. But I would say therapy together would be quite helpful. And then I would also say therapy for the child with the therapist alone, like one-on-one -on -one therapy would probably also mm -hmm. be helpful mm -hmm. if possible, because you want to work, I would suggest, again, this is just my opinion, I, I would suggest you want to mend that relationship as much as possible. And then also for the child, if they are struggling with their sexual orientation or other mental health issues, there are probably things that they want to or would benefit from talking about with a therapist that they don't necessarily want their parents in the room listening to them talk about these issues at the same time. So that would be my mm -hmm. suggestion in terms of finding a good clinician. That is going to be another Danger. Uh, challenge, unfortunately. Danger. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Because of uh, so-called conversion therapy bans. So in the U.S., you guys have this in 25 states where they have activists have been very smart to conflate gender identity with sexual orientation. So sexual orient orientation cannot be changed. So some, if someone is gay or bisexual, they can't be made to be straight. But gender identity is different. It can change over the lifespan, especially in children. And so what happens now is clinicians are terrified to question anyone who comes in saying they have issues with their gender or that they're experiencing gender dysphoria because they can potentially have their license uh, taken away. You know, in Canada, we have now a new law where a clinician can be imprisoned potentially for up to five years if they do not affirm. So you have clinicians who are understandably intimidated. And that is not that also, I mean, it goes without saying that the activists, if they find out, they will go after this person and try to ruin them both professionally and in terms of their personal reputation. So you have that. Um, and then also, I would say, if you can be open to telehealth, so just because a clinician is not necessarily operating in your state or your country, doesn't mean you aren't able to find good help. Um, I would say, look at a prospective clinician's social media, look at their publications. You don't necessarily have to read the whole thing because I know it's often behind a paywall, but if you can, it's helpful to get a sense of what is their approach. Are they woke? Are they buying all this gender ideology? Um, it's difficult for parents to really know what goes on in the room during therapy because clinicians, the woke ones, will lie. They will outright lie to parents and say, oh, we, I'm definitely going to address your concerns and all this, you know, comorbidity. And the minute the parent's not there, then they turn around and they affirm the child. They'll say to the child outright, mm -hmm. okay, now that your parent is gone, we're going to talk about, you know, what you want to talk about. Um, what else? When you I say, say? Wait, I would well, say, like, what, what country could they go to? I mean, Canada's no better than the United States. Like, you don't want to go to like Iran, <laughs> you know, you, we don't want to overcorrect, but what are the countries where 
the standard is not to just affirm, 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 where you might get actual measured, caring, smart advice. I would say it's about the individual clinician more so than the country. And you want to try and find a clinician who's more experienced, probably closer to retirement. So they they are less, they are not buying into the woke ideology. They're more confident in their practice. And they also don't care if they get fired because they're close to retirement. And that's just the the unfortunate wow. reality about it. So I would also say because younger clinicians, because they are less experienced, if they're newly licensed, they're more afraid of losing their license and all that they worked for. They're go- they've gone through, through grad school. They probably have lots of debt. They you know they just want to be working, and they probably also are not as sure what the right thing to do is with their patients in terms of is it actually okay to question because what they're being told from pretty much everybody except for bigots like me <laughs> is that <laughs> unless you affirm a person, a child or an adult is at a high risk of dying by suicide. So they're very scared. And I've had many conversations with them. They actually don't know. Even if they read the scientific research, they say, well, I don't know, is this outdated? And when you have all the professional bodies and scientific papers telling you that that research is outdated and you shouldn't listen to it, it, it can be very confusing, I would say, even for professionals in the field. So I would say, you know, you can also, most clinicians will let you have a little pre-phone call so before you actually go in for an assessment where they go through questionnaires and try to understand what you're you're dealing with or what you're presenting with. They Most will be open to having a, a phone call. So you can, as a parent, call and try to get a sense of what that person is like, you know, what type of approaches do they use, but it, it can be tricky. I, I would just say- Check them out. Definitely. If they're not openly screaming about wokeness and aff- affirmation- probably more likely that they're politically neutral or a little bit more reasonable. After a busy holiday season, now's the time to make time for you. Whether you want to refresh your fitness routine or just enjoy some relaxation, a Michael Phelps signature swim spa by Master Spas can be something you enjoy now and for the seasons to come. Making time for yourself, even if it's a 20-minute swim or sitting in the hot tub seats in a Michael Phelps Swim Spa can be incredibly beneficial to your mental health. And that is what Master Spas is all about, helping you live life better. A Michael Phelps Swim Spa combines the benefits of a pool with the therapy of a hot tub. It comes in a variety of sizes to complement almost any yard, even a small one. Exercising in the water is a great way to include physical activity into your daily life, whether you're a beginner or a fitness enthusiast. Michael Phelps Swim Spas are made 100% in the USA by Master Spas, the world's largest swim spa manufacturer. A Michael Phelps Swim Spa is energy efficient. You can use it all year long. Go to masterspas.com. Put in the promo code MK and that will save you $1,000 on a Michael Phelps Swim Spa or $500 on a Master Spas hot tub. Masterspas.com, promo code MK. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.